Hey, everybody. It's the Plant-Based Business Hour. I'm Elizabeth Alfano, your host of the Plant-Based Business Hour and the CEO of VegTech Invest. It's great to be with you today. I have a very exciting guest. Let me give you just a tad bit of background. So many of you maybe know on this podcast, if you've listened to episodes, from very early on in childhood, maybe my first memory as a five-year-old, as I was trying to, to not eat meat, and I would tell my parents that I didn't want meat, and I couldn't chew it, and I wasn't happy. <laughs> uh, fast forward into my adult years that I was not successful in converting my parents, and they pretty much drilled it into me, no, meat is what you have to do. So I stayed away from anything that I had to chew, but I did like things that were thin <laughs> that I, I couldn't really um, perceive in my mouth. Things like bacon, things like uh, deli meats, and things like prosciutto. Then fast forward even further in my life, and I'm dating an Italian winemaker. And we would go to Northern Italy and pick grapes every year, or at least oversee some of the grape picking. And uh, we would pair that wine with prosciutto. So today's guest is the former owner of Daniele, which back in the day when I was eating meat was my one and only go-to prosciutto. Daniele uh, is the best in class, if you will, if you are interested in that kind of thing, which back in the day I was. Davide, let's hope I get this right, Davide Dukovic, thank you for being on the Plant-Based Business Hour today. Oh, lovely to be here. So happy to have you and your unique perspective. So you are a former business owner of Daniele Prosciutto. You can tell everybody a little bit more about that in just a second. But you have switched gears and, and now as you focus more on impact investing or investing as a whole, one of the things you invest in is cultivated meat. So I want to hear this from a meat lovers and beat meat business owners perspective. Uh, but let's start at the beginning. Davide, for those who don't know, please explain Daniele and its history. Okay. Well, um, Daniele was a company that uh, my grandparents started in the 19, in 1945. Um, they were war refugees. Um, they had fled Yugoslavia and ended up in, in Trieste in Italy, a uh, border town. And uh, my grandmother started making sausages in, in, a, in her kitchen. And my grandfather would, would take the sausages in his bike and sell them to the local shops and restaurants. Uh, and eventually, you know, they saved money, the classic immigrant story. And they added other products like prosciutto and mortadella, uh, you know, what's famous now in the United States market as uh, known as charcuterie. And by the 70s, they had a nice thriving business. Uh, and in the 70s, you weren't allowed to sell prosciutto from Italy to the US. You weren't allowed to export it. And so my father decided to build a factory in the United States making prosciutto mm -hmm. uh, in Rhode Island. And that was 1976. And his timing was great because it was really uh, in a moment in American history where nobody knew what it was, you know, outside of a few delis in New York, um, you know, in Boston, Montreal, Chicago. Um, and he was really, he, he got to the United States with this idea, this product, um, when it was still on, on the ground floor. And over the course of the decades, um, you know, we were able, my, my father and then me and my brother, we joined um, in the 2000s. We were able to, to get the prosciutto into more or less every supermarket chain in the United States, like Costco and Trader Joe's, uh, you name it. And, um, and we ended up selling the business um, in 2019. Hmm. Recently. Mm-hmm. Was it hard to exit the business? It was, um, it, had, it had grown to such a degree, Elizabeth, where uh, we, we built a $100 million factory uh, in 2000, I want to say 13 or 14. It was such a giant investment. And it was clear that after, you know, four or five years, that we'd have to make another massive capital investment. Uh -huh. the, one problem with, the one problem with prosciutto factories is that uh, the capital spend is, is just huge. Um, I don't know if you've been to a prosciutto factory, Elizabeth, but uh, you, you know, you're dealing with just so much metal, so much space, these drying rooms like robotics at the end. And it, you know, I guess what, what we realized what, as a family, we sort of realized that the business was going away from what we knew and what we love to do, which is basically make, you know, salt, take a, a ham and salt it, and, you know, and, and then sell it it was going away from that really simple sort of dynamic to being able to plan financial things like, you know, loans. And, you know, it became more of like a, it became more, more of a financial sort of like a enterprise than, uh, than what we had originally, you know, set out to do. So it, it got out of our comfort zone. 
and I think we all decided that it was it was it was a good time to uh, to sell. And and um, for those who don't know, who did you sell it to? So we sold it to a private equity group um, out of Chicago. Yeah, and um, actually they've they've changed the name to um, Charcuterie Craftsman, I think. Mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the Daniele name is so well known. Uh, very interesting. Chicago, for those of you who don't know, used to be considered the slaughterhouse capital of the world. Animals would be trained in, to, put on trains, uh, taken to slaughterhouses in Chicago, and then redistributed out by trains from there. For a little bit of history, for those of you um, going back to the early 1900s, the Upton Sinclair book, The Jungle, is based on the workers' rights and animal rights, but really it's the workers' rights uh, of those working in factories, often an immigrant story that didn't go as well as perhaps Davide's did and um, what that is like there. And that sort of put uh, slaughterhouses on the map for human rights issues. And then that became maybe not as much as everybody wants, but that became some some animal rights issues as well. Just a little bit of history there. At the same time, since I'm on the Chicago roll and it is my hometown, at the same time, Chicago is the birthplace of vegetarianism in the United States. Wow. I'm sorry, I'm off on a tangent, Davide, oh, wow, but if you like your history, it's interesting. I had no idea. I, would, so, I was expecting it would, it would be coming from California, like all these trends, Oh gosh, right? no, no, no. So the Vegetarian Society came over from England to Philadelphia and it had a small group. But then in 1893 for the Chicago World's Fair, the Fidel Philadelphia group said, we should make this official. We should make it national. We're going to take out a booth at the World's Fair and we're going to promote the, the Vegetarian Society to the world. And that's when it took place in 1893, oh, the cool. U.S.'s first Vegetarian Society in Chicago. So um, that's what we, huh. that's what's, um, anyway, a little bit of Chicago history, but but back to you. Uh, okay, so you obviously from a, a meat eating, loving business family, you sell in 2019. Now, among many other things, you're investing and one of them is cultivated meat. Can you tell me why you're investigating in investing in cultivated meat and the other things you're investing in? Yeah. So, uh, so we, we saw the company in 2019, 2020, of course, was COVID and, uh, um, me and my, my wife, and we've got three little kids. We decided to, uh, you know, the year after the sale to spend a year in Europe. Uh, and yeah. so, and so we, uh, we choose Switzerland and, um, Beautiful. yeah, no, it was, it was the, the Southern part, um, near Lugano, uh, near the, um, the Italian border. I love Lugano. And, and, um, you know, I would drop the kids off at school and I would just go hiking on these beautiful trails in the mountains. And I'd listen to a lot of podcasts. And one of the podcasts that just kind of blew my mind um, was about um, cellular agriculture, lab-grown meat. It was the first time I'd ever heard of the concept. And it was kind of like, I was thunderstruck by it. Um, and I think one of the reasons that it was, it was so impactful is because, um, you know, I saw technology revolutionize so many industries, you know, most namely Uber with taxis or, or Airbnb with, you know, hotels. And I was always wondering how will technology um, how will technology revolutionize this ancient industry that I was in, you know, the meat industry? I, I knew that it was going to, there was going to be something, right? I just didn't, I didn't know what it would be. Mm -hmm. And so there I was walking on this trail for the first time hearing about, um, about this technology. And it was just kind of like, um, it was mind blowing. And um, like, I guess everybody else who, who, um, who hears about this technology for the first time, like the, um, and is excited about it. Um, the ramifications of it are so, are just so exceptional, especially for, especially Elizabeth, uh, for someone like me, who's um, sadly, you know, my family was using hundreds of millions of hogs a year, you know, to make our products. Mm -hmm. So I felt like it would be such a, um, it was, it would be such a nice, <laughs> no, such a great technology to, to, uh, to commercialize. Um, you know, I remember growing up as a kid, um, there was a famous movie called Babe. Remember with a with a pig? Oh, with? yes, James Cromwell, whom I've interviewed, who's been on this show, and the famous line is "That'll do, pig." Yes, I know it well. And I couldn't bring myself to watch the movie. I'd watch like I'd get ten minutes in, and it was so heartbreaking because of my family's line of work. It looked like such a beautiful movie, and it was so up my wheel. And I I grew up loving animals, you know. And even when I would go see the the, the hog farms, whatever. Um, I, it was always sort of like, I always had this special sort of connection to, to the, to the animals. And so I thought, wow, you know, this is, um, 
this technology could be such a nice um, could be such a nice sort of like an ethical um, a punctuation mark maybe to my life and to mm -hmm. my my family story. Um, I, I took it very very personally, you know. And needless to say, you know, um, obviously, you know, the, the ramifications of of uh, the environment are so wonderful, um, and of you know, the human pathogen, the strains that come from animals, and so all of these other great these great benefits. Uh, and I got really kind of like mesmerized by it. Um, and I, I went home from that walk and I did all this research, you know, and I learned that that my alma mater, uh, I went to Tufts University in Medford, Massachusetts. So it turned out that Tufts, bizarrely, was at the forefront of uh, of this study. And so, you know, I was like, man, this is like, <laughs> I felt like it was, um, I don't know, I, I, it, it seemed to me like there was something there that I needed to explore more, almost like it was calling to me calling out to me personally. Mm, that is really, really interesting. So this came to you kind of in a personal way after you had sold. So it didn't come to you as a business way of, I think the meat industry is in for a very difficult time. Exactly right. Yeah, right, right. Um, yeah. And it was, um, the, you know, like I think everybody feels, you know, when, when the, um, I, I had the, the initial the initial emotions were romantic em emotions. You know what I mean? Like, wow, wouldn't th this makes so much sense? And wouldn't it be lovely to to um, to you know put a dent in in factory farming? You know, mm. and um, and all of the all of the the, uh, the food that's raised just for animal consumption. You know, so yes. the the first the first sort of like uh, the first impulse was this romantic like thunderstruck. You know, <laughs> thunderstrike. Uh, and uh, and then of course like. Uh, any romantic, you have to learn, you know, the, the reality of the situation, which is, it's much more complicated to get to it. But always. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And also the other thing is that, you know, wh when I learned, when I learned about it, and when I learned about Tufts involvement in it, I, you know, I was told that the, that the, uh, at that time, the first PhD students in this field hadn't even graduated yet. That's how new it was, you know, in other words, they hadn't been studying for more than I think five or six years. This whole thing is just so, it's so new. And so like the second, kind of, you know, my second realization was, no, it's not happening tomorrow, mm. but um, it's, it's extremely sort of empowering to think that because we're at such an early stage that one of my, you know, perhaps, hopefully, one of my contributions can actually bring this to, um, to reality, you know, that, you know, we're almost like on the ground floor and, that, and that's extremely energizing. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that you're going through sort of um, a, a personal bell curve, if you will. So what you'd like your legacy to be. Um, and I think that's very interesting from a, a evolving standpoint, both from business and from a personal standpoint. So you talk about your your personal sort of, oh, wouldn't it be great if my life ended on this kind of note? Not, not that your life ends, but you know that it's, it, it yeah. has this kind of punctuation mark to it. The flip side is, I do also think the same is true from a business perspective. I was just asked to speak at Bloomberg Intelligence. I um, and work on Wall Street in the financial markets, and Bloomberg often calls me as their um, expert speaker on uh, diversified proteins. And I was on a panel with the Cattle Ranchers Association and representatives from the swine sector, as well as the Bloomberg analyst from the chicken sector, and they were saying, we need more subsidies because uh, avian bird flu had jumped to a cow, had jumped to a human. So subsidize us more. We need more subsidies because the Environmental Protection Agency is fining us for uh, water eutrophication, dirtying the water. We need more subsidies because the margins are too small. We need more subsidies because we're expecting fines because of the emissions we em emit. And with AI showing transparency in the supply chain and with scopes one and two demanded by the SEC, scopes one, two, and three demanded by the state of California. Scopes, everyone, is where you uh, disclose your emissions anywhere in the supply chain. Scopes one and two closer to the product. Scope three all the way the beginning of the supply chain. Scope three is where all the emissions are, particularly in animal agriculture. So all these sticks, if you think of life as like a bunch of carrots on a bunch of sticks, all these sticks coming for the business equation that is meat, and their answer to that is more subsidies. And as a capitalist, I think, wow, the business equation that can't survive without subsidies is not a business equation I want to be a part of because 
That's that's not a successful business equation from my perspective. So it's interesting that it wasn't the meat industry potentially turning around. It was more um, the the good you could do in the world. Right, right. Um, listen, Elizabeth, I'm um, I'm Catholic, and you know I, I <laughs> you know the whole Catholic thing of when you're in front of Saint Peter, right? What 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 can you say that or what can you show that you've done, right? And so I do think that having making improving the lives of animals would be a, a noble kind of a, a existential thing oh i'm so touched by that <laughs> i really also so we have lots in common you and i uh, i lived in italy for a little bit i was a raised devout catholic i raised by nuns really i don't know if you had any um schooling with no unfortunately not. i mean you know just like the usual first communion classes and confirmation but no i didn't go to catholic school I did. I had private girls school with nuns until uh, high school. And then I had private school with Jesuits. I got it all. Wow. And um, of course, St. Francis of Assisi, my my saint of preference. Okay, the conversation has diverged. Um, okay, well, what do you think, coming from your deep history in meat, what do you think the meat industry will look like? And when will cultivated meat start to take a chunk of that business? Wow, that's that's such mm. a great question, and I wish I wish I had the answer, Elizabeth. Um, personally, I've I've made investments in in the um, in the cultivated um, meat space, and um, it's the one area of the, you know my sort of like asset management where I really don't um, I don't I'm not that interested in making a return in, on that. You know, my my ROI <laughs> with those with the investments in that industry is kind of like not important to me. The important thing is that. Again, like it's the one part of my life that I feel completely idealistic about where if hopefully, you know, a dollar of that investment goes and, and, you know, makes a scientist have a breakthrough or, you know, it helps with commercialization that, you know, that in 10 years we could, you know, hopefully see, um, see a sell a hamburger or a hot dog on, you know, on the shelf. Yeah. Even if my company wasn't the company that I invested in wasn't the one that did it, you know that would be like uh that would be a, a good outcome and so mm -hmm. with that having been said you know i i um i have also completely realized that i am um i'm quite ignorant uh, on the science of cell agriculture and also um quite honestly it seems like the um the startups now are um are you know siloed and um they you know they're kind of like protecting their information which i completely understand you know especially after you know you see the juggernauts like in, in, in possible and you know these these companies have have, have um, been so successful, and I understand why you want to sort of like be the one that wins, and that's a really I think a positive info, impulse, and I think that 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 will serve the industry well. But because there's so many startups right now, um, I do kind of um, I hesitate on um, on investing more on, on the, in the private side more than what I've already invested, just because um, yeah it's it's it does seem very. Um, it, you know, I, you know, the, one of the worst, one of the worst things that to happen is indeed like you give a lot of money to a startup that you feel you find promising, but you find, you know, you figure out that you didn't know that much about that company or about the industry and it goes to zero and that you know, there's no sort of like benefit. Um, so more recently, say the past year, I've been, uh, I've been more focused on, on uh, making um, donations to, uh, to, to the, to the nonprofit side. Like um, I, I um, spe specifically with Tufts University, you know, I, I gave them a million dollars a couple of years ago, and I've been um, I've been really, really sort of like a great champion of that program at the school. I was really the most heartening thing um, that I've found over the past what three, four years of being involved in this space is that the students, the kids, at, the undergrads at Tufts University, are clamoring to study um, SOAG. You know that it's a grassroots thing. It's not just like guys on the top like me, you know, like uh, you know who are who are sort of like trying to push this through. No, this is like something. This is a technology that has um, that you know young people are are uh, are so eager to pursue. And I think that that's like maybe the most important thing that you know um, that that kind of ballast uh, to 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 come out you know with with an answer hopefully will come from these kids. Yeah, it's so funny. I'd love to bookend this because I love what you're saying that it's that new generation and it's going to take the new generation that one is inheriting all of the planet's problems. So unfortunately, they're the ones that are solving it. They didn't, they inherited it. They didn't make the problems, they inherited them. And now they're uh, steadfast in solving them and that they're so dedicated for all the reasons, the animal welfare, the environmental, the unique challenge and um, innovation curve that's so exciting if you're a 
young intellectual mind. Then I'll, I'll bookend it on the other end. I too used to be an impact investor in the, the small startups. And I just realized the sector's just kind of, you know, working against each other. There's so many little ones. And then when they fall apart, you have no impact at all. So that's when I started my work at VegTech Invest and our, our ETF in the public markets, because I really realized for real change, it's going to have to be the good actors in the public markets. There are good actors and they're large enough to make a difference. They have global teams, they have large advertising budgets, they have huge distribution channels. So those, you know, Ingredient, Givaudan, these kind of large international companies that are really focused on our sector, putting in lots of CapEx, lots of R&D spend, positioning themselves for when the market turns around to be ready to grab the business. And I, I really think we need those large actors to move the needle. Um, and I feel that even more so coming out of COP28, which is... Um, the United Nations Annual Summit on Climate Change. I spoke about this in December there and, um, you know, reiterated by the World Bank and the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, that um, really it's how do we move the large public players. And um, anyways, we try to do that with, with our ETF. So I think it's very interesting. We have the bell curve of who's getting all the press is the startups in the middle, but I think it's the students and their passion and their knowledge drop and grab at the same time. And then it's the large players. Yeah, completely. You know, it's really, really heartening that last weekend at Harvard, yes. uh, something like what, two, 300 kids got together. You know, I always, I'm 50 years old, Elizabeth. So I'm like, to me, everybody is a kid. <laughs> <laughs> So like these, you know, all these these students came together, and it was kind of like a student-led um, conference on cell ag. You know, it was incredibly well attended, and um, yeah, I mean, it's just it's just really great. To, to your point, I definitely think that, you know, you look at the success of uh, electric vehicles, mm -hmm. and indeed they had a lot of tax breaks and tax incentives uh, from the government. I think justifiably, just because it was such a, there's just so much, um, you know, capital capital intensi intensivity. To this, you know, you're not making an app here. You're trying to change how, you know, how uh, a really huge um, industrial market, you know, and so for sure that maybe like a tax break or something like that. I think that that's that's like um, it's it's going to be a requirement. Mm -hmm. I think so too. That came out of COP28 as well, coming from the World Bank, this idea of blended capital. So you would have philanthropic capital, government capital, uh, Wall Street money and VCs all working together. You're already starting to see this, folks, um, even though the market remains tumultuous in an election year, which adds more, more uh, vic vicissitudes, if you will, to our daily lives. But um, you're starting to see Jeff Bezos Earth Fund, uh, Gates has been in it for a while, Milken Institute. I just interviewed them yesterday for my New York Stock Exchange podcast, Upside and Impact. So you're starting to see these large philanthropic members uh, wrap their minds and wallets around food. You're starting to see governments around the world. The U.S. actually um, government gave the initial grant to Tufts for cultivated meat, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and then yep. others added on. So you're starting to see more of that grant money. Um, I'm working at Wall Street. <laughs> and then VCs are, are still in the mix. So I think you're seeing this blended capital. And um, I'm very eager to see the supply chain. So what we do is we really focus on the supply chain, building out the infrastructure and the good actors in the public markets that are doing that. I'd like to see that happen in cultivated meat. And my understanding is that the mediums for the cells to grow are still very expensive, making it really not scalable. So there has to be that innovation R&D in helping bring those prices down. Are there any other weak spots in yeah, the- Yeah, no, I think that um, that's the, I, I hear about this a lot. The um just the, the bioreactor, right? Kind of like these giant vats, almost like, you know, to me, it always sort of evokes this idea of like a beer tank, you know, when you're brewing yeah. beer, similar. Um, and so, you know, that, that's just, that's extremely expensive. Um, and it's, um, I, I, I kind of, I'm hopeful um, that if we can't get like the, the ideal product out, you know, like um, as, I, as I was alluding to earlier, like a, a cell ag hot dog or hamburger, um, you know, maybe like the baby step of a hybrid, you know what I mean? Of You know, where, where you're combining a plant with like a cell lag product, that would be, I think, um, you know, it would be progress. Uh, you can't always get the every, like when with EVs, for example, you know, the, 
the, I think the first car that made me think about, um, about that, you know, about the possibilities of that was the Prius, right? And it was, you know, you were using gas, not as much, uh, but the battery technology all of a sudden became something that people were, were talking about. And yeah, so I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that, that we'll see that, that we'll see more incremental steps that, that, that then can like let people realize that there's, uh, that there's, um, you know, this technology can actually work. Mm -hmm. And I love that you say that because uh, I am, I'm all about the hybrid. I cannot wait for cultivated fat to be dropped right into that plant-based burger so that meat eaters are getting that, you know, animal fat that they're missing and maybe some texture and, uh, uh, along with it, you know, some mouthfeel along with that flavor. And that's a huge step forward. So I'm looking at that because cultivated meat is probably realistically eight to 10 years out, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> at least so. right. But but hybrids, I think, could be two to three years out. So I'm really very excited about that. And um, you know, I think it's going to take all hands on deck. So I'm interested in the innovation still in the plant based space. I'm interested in the innovation still in the fermented protein space. And then I'm interested in this hybrid, cultivated, and and plant foods. And then ultimately, we will get to cultivated meat. But I remind everyone. Mm -hmm. Innovation curves are very slow in the beginning. Maybe I'll see if I can bring up a, a, a visual here. Innovation curves, hopefully everybody can see that. I'm sorry for those of you listening on audio. I'm bringing up an S-curve of adoption. This is pretty much the S-curve for the electric vehicles. And many uh, scholars think that uh, cultivated, well, uh, plant-based innovation, so that would be cultivated meat, fermented proteins, plant-based that this will follow this S curve. And, and that is, it starts out very slow at the beginning, needing lots of capital, lots of R and D. And then it ramps up as the prices come down and you see kind of mass adoption. And these curves take a while. So this curve that we're looking at now currently on our screen starts in around 2020 and goes to around, oh, hey, ho, around 20, everyone pull out your glasses around 2050. So, you know, it takes a while, but the real, that, that jump, comes between 2030 and like 2035. So um, EVs just starting to, starting to ramp up now, 20% of all electric vehicles, 20% uh, of all car sales are now electric vehicles. That's not cars on the road. That's car sales. So that shows you how a gas car and an electric vehicle car are on the on the road together. And that's just what it will be in proteins, right? You'll have diversified proteins. So animal proteins and, and uh, diversified proteins living together in the grocery store, if you will. And it's that kind of slow ramp over and change that I believe will take place. So um, it's, it's just, I, I just note it because in today's world, I really speak for Wall Street here. People are like, where are my returns today? Oh, and maybe I'll be patient and wait till like the end of the month, but where are my returns? And it just, it just doesn't work that way. It took years, decades of investing in the internet before people really made money on NVIDIA semiconductors. So keep yeah. that in mind, people. Well, the, I think that, the, the, again, a positive thing about that, Elizabeth, um, it, you know, the optimistic thing with that is that um, when, when that, you know, on your graph, when the S curve, when that sort of when the technology is proven and you're going to have all these people jumping on the bandwagon and you're going to be the, the the og you know what i mean you're going to be the person who was there the whole time you know you're not just going to be a, a me too or or uh you know i think that it's, it's important that we're there now yes um you know and that we're we're sort of like really planting the seeds yes. um yeah yeah, I think that that, that and that, that's like a, I think that's a very very noble thing, and it's easy to get to get on board when everybody else is. But I think that the, the you know it takes a lot of kind of guts and courage to be there now. And I think that actually it's also beyond that. It's also the most important players are 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 the ones who, who come in early. So. Mm. Yes, I would agree with that. And I want to thank you for that, for coming in early, for your donation to Tufts, for being an investor in the sector, and for caring about it for all the reasons, from business all the way to human health and animal welfare. So um, I thank you for being an early visionary. As we kind of wrap up today, I wondered on a on kind of a personal note, um, unless there's anything else you'd like to add about cultivated meat, where you think it's going? Uh, no, you know, I'm, I'm very kind of... Um... I'm inspired by the kids um, and I, I'm very hopeful. 
Yeah, I find that universe, because I do a lot of public speaking, not just um, on Wall Street, but kind of all over the place. And I find that universities, NYU, Yale, Harvard, Berkeley, UCSD, I've, all of them are like clamoring to, you know, I do I'm getting invitations all over the place. And it's really heartening to see everybody, you know, it's so heartening to see an entire major big sector get it mm. when you open the newspaper and you're like, oh my God. The, the quote unquote regular folks aren't getting it, but the next generation really yep. Yep. gets it. So that's um, inspiring. Uh, okay. You have had an interesting career and investing path. What do you wish you knew 10 years ago? You can change this to five if you'd like. What do you wish you knew 10 years ago that you know now? Oh, that I know now. Um, I think that it's, you never, um, yeah, it's, uh, Whenever I, I made a plan, it, it always goes haywire. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I do know. what happens in my in my in my sort of graph, Elizabeth, is that the, the opposite of what I what I was expecting happens. You know, and then somehow everything sort of dovetails, like <laughs> in the end, somehow. And it so, comes together. Um, just to kind of the, to keep faith, I think, is the most. I know it's very basic, but it's true. I do love that. And I do say that all the time. Keep the faith, everybody. In whatever form you hold it, organized or not, uh, keep the faith. Boy, I sure need that in, in these times. Um, maybe keep the faith and don't watch the news. Maybe those are the two things. Do not watch the news. Step away from the television and the phone, for that matter. Uh, okay, you're having a bad day. Things didn't go your way. What is the one phrase you tell yourself to get yourself back in the groove? So yeah, so it's similar to the thing I just said, uh, um, people plan and God laughs. Just okay. kind of, you know, you can't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's a, it's like, I think... God has a, you know, even my, our Catholic God, Elizabeth, has a great sense of humor. <laughs> you know, you got to like and realize it. Yeah. Uh, and a long sense of humor. Like yeah. he, he's, yeah. he's been laughing now for a while. Right. That's right. It's <laughs> yeah. totally right. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my gosh. Uh, and my last question for you before I let you get on with your busy day. You are running around and you don't have time for lunch. What is your go-to snack? Well, listen, this is not so much something that I can do and I can whip out in, in a second, but it's, I've just discovered um, anchovies oh. as a cooking ingredient. Okay. okay. And I learned this, I follow all of these old, you know, nonne, all the old grandmothers, on, yes. they've got, they're on the social media. Yeah. And yeah. as their base for their tomato sauce, they're always using um, anchovies. Yeah. yeah. And so you put it in there with the oil and the thing disintegrates and then you put in your tomato sauce. And it gives such a nice uh, flavor. It's just it richens everything. I, and apparently they're very healthy. So, um, so uh, you are from Northern Italy. My father born in Sicily. So I am from Sicily where, yes, anchovies is kind of a go-to there. Uh, not for me anymore since I stopped eating um, meat, dairy, and fish. But uh, I know the... the my grandmother cooked heavily with anchovies. I I know it well. And a unique taste, anchovies. Yeah. It's not just salt. It's right. something else. It's like a salt olive. Right. It's, right. So when I replace, as a Sicilian cook myself, uh, even without the meat, I use olive juice. To, it's got like a brininess, right? Right. Anchovies are, so I... I uh, we'll have to have a cook off together. Yeah, it's like a umami, right? Yes, like a, exactly yeah, right. Yeah. But a unique umami, different than something like mushrooms or even yeah. meat. It's got right. that umami of the sea. Can I yeah. say that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> umami of the yeah, sea. Yeah, maybe you can throw some seaweed in there too to, as a replacement. You see, you oh, you see, great minds think alike. Um, I want to thank you for your generous spirit. And so much fun. And so happy to have you here and your your um, overall perspective and really your your very good heart. And so thank you for the support and the interest and the unique story of um, what kind of trajectory one's life can take despite where they start. It's interesting to see where they might end up, which is interesting, I think, your story. So thank you for sharing it with us today. So great to have you here. So much fun. Thank you, Elizabeth. I had such a good time. Oh, so kind of of you. Do don't go away, but everybody else on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter, I will see you next week live from Chicago at the Future, uh, Future of Protein Production uh, Summit. So we'll see everybody there. Davide, stay put. Bye, everybody.